Welcome back to the show. We are here for another exciting episode of In the News. It feels like since we last met, Derek, I, I don't know, like the news has exploded with real estate stories. I usually like need to take a little bit of time to put together the articles for this. Like, no joke, off my Google search, I decided to go out the top three because one, they're that good. And two, like, there's just so much information out there right now, too. Right? It's crazy. And I feel like there's what's super interesting is that when things are hectic, and this isn't just real estate, but things are hectic in the world in general, it seems like news comes out on both sides of the issue. Like, it is constantly buying a home right now is the dumbest thing you could ever do. If you're paying rent and not buying a home, you're the biggest idiot in the world. And those two articles are trending at the same time. And it's like, I don't, <laughs> what's true? There's like fear mongering out there too, which you'll get from a lot of the major news outlets, depending on which, you know, political party that is, is given. For money, sure. Right. But like my two articles and we'll get, we can get right into it, basically contradict one another as well too. And we're oh, I love at, that. We're looking at Wall Street Journal. Ooh, and, respected source. And CNBC. Another pretty, another pretty respected source, right? So let's just jump right into it. This is my first one. Mortgage rates are higher now because no one is buying mortgages. That's the name of the article? That's the name of the article, right? I, you know, I got to say, without any research, empirically, I just, in my, in my inner self, I think, bullshit. There's no way that that's accurate. Well, you know, we're going to get into it, but the, my, my next article... Mortgage rates sharply fall due to under uh, under seven percent due to inflation ease, not because people are buying mortgages now because inflation's easing up, right? So let's get back to the first article from the Wall Street Journal. Mortgage rates are higher now because people aren't buying mortgages. And Matt, you know, let's 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 go back to a couple episodes ago. This is basically what the Fed wanted. The Fed didn't want people to buy houses. They were technically trying Correct. to get out of the market. Wasn't the whole drive behind the unnaturally low deflated interest rates to inspire people to become home buyers? And then once we did and we overcorrected and now we had so many loans outstanding that we couldn't cover it anymore, it was like, okay, wait a second. We got to bring these rates back a little bit. <laughs> I mean, so, you know, standing from the outside perspective, there's a million things that go into interest rates and factor interest rates. Right. But the number one driver right now, and you don't need to be an expert to know this, is inflation. Right. Right. It's not the amount of people out there buying houses. It's not the amount of people out there trying to get mortgages. It's inflation. And the this is like a chicken or the egg thing, right? Like, right. it's probably fair to say inflation is causing fewer people to buy homes and subsequently the rates are rising or maybe at the same time the rates are rising. But I think it's a mis miscalculation to say that rates are rising because people aren't buying. Like, that's a, a misnomer. Well, here's, here's, here's kind of the one piece that might ring true to this is that interest rates could technically be going up because the Fed's not buying mortgage-backed securities, which they ah, the now that could be true. But if that's the case, is this just kind of a bullshit title? Is this a title where clickbait, right? <laughs> a, a clickbait title. I don't really know what to, what to take of the, what to make of the title, but I was astounded when I saw it was on Wall Street Journal's page as well too. Well, so when I hear this, I think the big takeaway, if I'm reading anything on interest rates right now, it, whether I'm a consumer or if I'm thinking as a real estate agent, I'm taking it all with a grain of salt. Because the truth is, even if we look at like Powell in the Fed, they don't understand how to curb what's happening right now. They're behind the ball. They didn't expect inflation to get out of hand like it did. And now we're playing cut, catch up really as an international community, but certainly in the United States, right? So when we look at what's happening with inflation and how it's impacting the marketplace, we don't understand exactly what's happening or how we're going to get through it fully right now. This is an unprecedented time in terms of inflation in this country. Well, so well, then when I hear this advice on, you know, what, whether you should take that into act when you're buying a home or the reality of it is, I think you just need to fully understand your numbers and understand that we are in a market that's highly volatile with your interest rate. Right. Well, I mean, you kind of hit the nail on the head, Matt. And don't worry, because not only do you or I not understand that much about inflation, but Jeremy Powell, the Fed chairman, literally came out and said verbatim, 
the one thing that we know about inflation is how little we know about inflation. Right? <laughs> right? right? Yeah. You understand why there's confusion, if nothing else. Well, there's a lot of confusion. You see articles like this and where people are like, well, like, am I a cause of the problem? Do I need to go out there and buy a mortgage? You know, like, it's just a little misleading, right? Yeah. Now, let's jump into that. I know you got some articles too, but the next one kind of goes into this a little bit and why I think that last article is bullshit is because, you know, CNBC, mortgage rates fall sharply to under 7% after inflation ease, right? Right. So here we see a direct cause and what came out. And just so everyone knows, they got a CPI re like index report last week and that plummeted rates. And it was a yeah. breath of fresh air for a lot of loan officers, a lot of consumers as well too. But the And by plummeted, we mean like rates were at, I mean, what, seven and a quarter or getting close to it? And now they're at six and a half. I'm going to give you that right now. The average 30-year fix plunged 60 basis points from 7.22 to 6.62%. Wow. Okay? Get this. This is where I find it pretty interesting, too. This essentially matched the drop in interest rates that we saw at the start of the pandemic. Wow. So the drop there is similar to when everybody was so excited when it became so cheap in the in the relative drop. Correct. Now, wow. breath of fresh air, I get 6.5 sounds great when you're looking at 7, 7.2. But if you were here last year at three, it's still very painful. I understand it's more double than what yeah. we were looking at last year. Yeah. Right. But, you know, again, and that just kind of interwines with the last article where it's like, no, it's not because people are buying. It's because there's other economic forces here that we got to factor in as well, too. And the main driver, the main one being inflation. And the, and the Fed has been very yeah. steadfast on their on their approach to that, where they're not lowering interest rates until they see the tick or at least lower the inflation a little bit as well, too. Well, and I think that's the bigger portion of this that I would take away. Right. So as we think about mortgage interest rates. They are highly volatile right now, and they're heavily tied to what's happening in the Fed. The Fed does not know how to curb inflation fully, so they're still working through a solution there. So if you're just working that out as an equation, this is based on that. Well, we are going to continue to see volatility until that's figured out, right? So what I would take away as a home buyer, though, I hear constantly, and it's been around for years, it'll be around for years, this idea of timing the market. And when it's like this, you are just gambling. This is like coming in and throwing money on red or black and just hoping that it's going to double your fortune, right? Like right. you have no strategy for timing this market. We didn't know last Monday that rates were going to drop six basis points on Friday. Nobody had any indication that was happening. I was urging people to lock last Monday. Exactly. Interest rates went up a quarter point, right? So, you know, when we think about that, like it, when people read these articles, I think, unfortunately, the first reaction is, oh, well, I'll, I'll wait till things get better to dive in. We, A, don't have a timeline for better on inflation. And B, you don't know that you're going to dive in at a good or a bad moment. This is why the people who could take advantage, and frankly, I'm one of them, right? I'm currently buying a house. I was in the process of evaluating rates when rates dropped. So I was able to lock the lower rate because I'm active and ready. For people who are just getting started today, they may have already missed a little drop. And by the time they're ready to find a house, they get their strategy together, they call you for a pre-approval, rates might've gone back up. So the problem with timing the market is you have an imperfect science in front of you to guess what you're gonna get or what you're gonna work with. I mean, you know how many people told me they were gonna wait for the right time at four and a half? When rates right, because the market was gonna crash, right? Yeah. Like, And, and, and it, it amazes me how many people don't know that they can refinance. You know, right. it yeah. surprises me. So a lot of my job has actually been to educate. Hey, listen, this is a two year loan. You right. Know, we're going we're gonna to refinance into something a little bit later down the track. You know, we'll get the hesitation. Well, then I basically, you know, I wasted two years of payments. Well, no, you could take out a 20 year mortgage. Right. right? You're not going to lose that. You could look at a 23 year mortgage for all we care. Right? Absolutely. And let me tell you, Matt, buying at a 7% interest rate, still better than renting. Absolutely. Every day of the week, right? And what, what I think about that too, this is when people are always worried about making a bad decision that they're going to regret later, right? right? And they talk to you all the time. Well, I don't want to buy now because what if the interest rate goes down? Let's play this out. There's only one of two scenarios that happens in the future. The rate goes up or it goes down. One of those two things is going to happen. If it goes up, 
you're a fucking genius because you locked your rate today better than what it will be in the future. Yeah. If it goes down, you refinance and you change your payment structure to be more forgiving. There is no downside, right? <laughs> so when you're looking at real estate, when I hear people talk about, like, oh, I'm unsure right now because the interest rate, if you're buying based on the interest rate, you already don't understand how you should be approaching this, this process, right? Buying a home should be based on your needs, what you actually can afford in the marketplace on a monthly basis and looking at your savings for a down payment, right? The rate highly impacts what you can afford in that process. And you will be beholden to it when you get in the marketplace. But if you're coming out of renting right now and you know you wanna buy, and the only thing preventing you is that you don't know about the interest rates, that's a mistake, that's flawed thinking. You should sit down and see what you can afford within that interest rate structure and then see if that fits for you. And if it doesn't, okay, maybe you should rent another year. But if it does, then it's time to go, right? You, you lose nothing if you get involved. I mean, I like to liken, and I know it's coming from a mortgage broker, so, you know, take it for what you will, but I like to liken interest rates to gas, you know? Yeah. When you see gas going up, people him and haw, they complain, but you know what they do? They get in their car, they drive to work, they drive to the grocery store. So, like, yeah. yeah we don't have traffic on bikes in Chicago yet, regardless of how high the gas prices have gone, no. so... <laughs> no, no, especially not right now when it's fucking snowing up, right? Yeah, right. So, you know, the idea of waiting for interest rates to lower, I think, is a little, you know, dated. But yeah. the idea of having interest rates determine whether or not you're going to buy, I think it's just not a, is an uninformed decision to make. It's a, it's a flawed reasoning of what the interest rate really is, right? Yeah. It is absolutely a factor in your monthly cost. You absolutely need to understand it so that you understand what you can really afford. But if you're choosing not to buy because of where the rate is, you're really not even you're not even looking into the possibility of bettering your financial situation because you don't like the interest rate. I mean, that's just a flawed approach to this process. Yeah, and I mean, I and Matt, I have people now willing to pay points to get their interest sure. rate lower. And I'm, I'll look at him and I'll say, I'll be honest with you, like your break even on this is five years out. Yeah. The likelihood that we're going to refinance this thing, I'd bet my 401k on it, you know? Right. And, and they and I think it's still the sticker shock where they're like, well, this rate's lower though. I'm yeah. Like, You'll never get the money back that you're spending today. Right. It's, it's a sticker shock thing. And I think a lot of it, a lot of it has to do with, interest rates were historically low 12 months ago. Right. Yeah. And they're not now. So that's, that's what it is. It's the disparity where people thought that they left off. Hey, I'm going to wait around. You know, let me tell you, we're not going to see another 2.125 on a 15 year fix. No, it's not anytime very, soon. Very long time. You know? Well, it's interesting you talk about disparity because that's where our, my article started. So the first one I brought to the table today is from Yahoo Finance. And I think it really is a reflection of the disparity in the real estate market from 2021 to 2022. So the article title is 37% of real estate agents in the US couldn't afford to pay their rent in October. Another bad sign for the housing market. Here are, th are three key takeaways for the sellers right now. So what they say are the takeaways really is don't miss with your pricing, do time the market correctly, and make sure that you're shifting your expectations slightly as a seller. And all of that points to the fact that we have a more volatile marketplace right now. On the real estate agent side, the reason people aren't able to pay their rent is because many people got this false sense of confidence that they were running a business that was able to sustain at a time when we had jet fuel injected into our industry, right? Yeah. Everybody had a career year in 2021. If you didn't, that's your fault because everybody else did. Nice. It just is what it is. And now yeah. when you hear people bragging about that, I always take it with a grain of salt because the truth is value skyrocketed on housing. So you really didn't have to do even as much work as we had to do in 2020 and you could have blown away your volume numbers, right? So I think it was a very confusing world in the sense that a lot of agents got a false sense of confidence. They believed their business was maybe bigger than it was and they didn't set up good practices for success moving into a volatile market. So now when we talk about mortgage applications being in an all time low, interest rates are high, homes are harder to negotiate for and buy and sell, agents aren't surviving, right? We're cutting the flat. So I think we are going to see a, a transition in this industry. And what I take away from this article really is that now is a time where you're going to see bad agents leave. Oh, hundred percent, especially in my world too, where if you're a renovate, if you're a refinance person, you're gone, you're gone, long gone, right? 
Now I read an article on re and I'm and I'm calling this from memory. I want to say the title was nearly eight hundred thousand realtors haven't closed a deal this year. Yeah. Does that ring does that ring a bell? Does that ring yeah, a bell? I think I read the same exact thing. Yeah, and I mean that being said, there's probably a lot of years where there's a lot of agents that don't close many deals as it is, you know? Yeah. But that number is staggering to me. Right. I think we have it in Chicago. I mean, even when you look at, we have 48,000 and change, or maybe it might be over 50,000 active practicing real estate agents here in Cook County in Chicago land. And of that, I would bet, I don't want to even put a percentage on it, but a, a strong percentage do less than one deal a year. I mean, probably 25% or more do, do less mean, than one deal. And that, and that number could be a little misleading because how many part-time agents do you know? Like there's a lot of- For sure. Them. You get people who are just like, ah, you know, I'll get it so I can sell my own house and then I'll never right. do anything with it. And, you know, right. there's, there's plenty of valid reasons, but I do think there are a lot of people who got in this industry when it was easy to make a quick buck. They helped buyers at a time when it was easy to win as a buyer and a seller, really. Because easy to win as a buyer in the sense that if you just raised your hand and said you're in real estate, there were 50 of them that needed your help, right? I'm not, I need to buy. Yeah. Negotiation was hard, but you also didn't really have to negotiate. We weren't able to use any of the levers we had. As is was gone. Um, home sale contingencies were gone. Appraisals, gone. Inspections, gone. So like the, you didn't even have to practice real estate. You had to bring a buyer through the door. You had to tell them to pay more than everybody else had already offered. And that's how you won as a buyer's agent. And as a seller's agent, you priced it at a point that was semi-reasonable, and then you waited 12 hours for 20 offers, and then you signed one. And that, when agents started in the business and that was how it worked, they were like, oh, real estate is a cash printer, right? Like, so now you need even a little bit of business practice. Buyers aren't just falling out of trees. They're harder to come by, and you need to really know referrals to get in touch with them. They need a lot of guidance and advice because negotiations are back, and you got to pull some levers to get things done. And sellers are in one of the most difficult markets they've seen in the last two years where everything's sitting for a while. They don't have buyers that can afford their home anymore because of interest rates. And they don't have anywhere they can go that they can afford, particularly against the rate that they're locked in at most likely. Yeah. So it's this fundamental shift on the marketplace. And really this is where you and I as professionals shine because this is when we have to help our clients. Well, not only that, but you know, our competition is going to be much less after this too. Oh yeah, it's going to be a lot easier to practice when there's half the competition, right? This is a year where we'll see 10 to 15% of our industry locally just drop to be I off. Mean, the you know, we see it on the mortgage side and I guess, and I guess that could go into my next article here. I know you got another one, so I'll be quick. Mortgage lenders V to be last man standing as rates soar. So wow. what I found very interesting about this article is talking about how these non-banking institutions came in at the front of this financial crisis to originate mortgages and they killed it last year. Don't get me wrong, yeah. but these are all the people that are now losing their jobs and selling their company and that because they can't really compete or they can't really outlast a lot of these bigger mortgage companies that have been doing it for years that have right. with resources that have, you know, the, the capital of chase bank behind them and things like that, you know, right. So it was something that I'm not surprised to see this. But I am, you know, was, I just found it to be an interesting read because it made sense, right? Where a lot of these, a lot of these smaller non-banking institutions, they came in and now they're gone, right? It's going right. like, to be like these COVID testing facilities, right? Where you yeah. pop up every second, you know, in a year they'll be gone. Flash right? in the pan, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, it's interesting you say that because I, I am thinking about what we're talking about. Agents' income is down to the point where they can't afford rent across the country. Lenders are out of business, straight up. Whole shops are closing or lenders are losing their jobs because they can't practice at the level they were anymore. Yeah. Buyers are on the fence because interest rates are high and sellers are struggling to sell the way that they thought they could sell. So All of that together, I think, paints a really rocky picture of the real estate market. But I do think it's an accurate one right now. We're in a tumultuous time. So when I see things, and actually this is my next article, so Fortune Magazine, the U.S. housing market is, uh, is set to see the second biggest correction of the post-World War II era when to expect home prices to bottom. Um, I read that article, and I think about everything we just compared it, and part of me immediately jumps to, oh, my God, they're right. We're going to see a huge bottom fallout in the real estate market, and we all need to prep for it. The other part of me jumps to the data we're actually seeing, though, and I think here in Chicago – 
we haven't felt that as much. Are we seeing prices come down? Absolutely. We're seeing a lot of price reductions. We're seeing some people take it off the market. They'll probably come back on in the spring and try again. But we are not seeing 20, 25, 30% reductions like they are in these major metropolitan markets. I saw another article from Fortune Magazine that uh, it was like the Austin market crashed 20% or the national market crashed 20%, right? Like a 20% correction is painful and massive. We are seeing price adjustments in like the three to five, right? And that's a standard seasonality thing more than anything. So we really haven't, knock on wood, we haven't felt a shift in the marketplace here in Chicagoland so much that prices are resetting. We just haven't. Is that just Chicago or is that other major metro cities as well too? We, so the interesting thing about Chicago, pre-pandemic, all major metropolitan cities in the United States, and I forget what the threshold was, but I think it was basically in a metro area over a million people or something, right? Chicago was the only undervalued metropolitan area in the United States. So when we looked at New York, San Francisco, you know, these places way overvalued. The, the prices are already super inflated pre-COVID, and then it got worse. Same thing in Florida, same thing in Austin. Chicago, just comparison, you know, price per square foot with other major cities, we were at a lower cost basis. So coming into the pandemic, I think we were soft. So when we had this skyrocket of activity, we kind of went to neutral or maybe fair pricing and then threw it a little bit, but we didn't start above it already and then accelerate even more. That's where you're seeing the crash. The people who are already probably overweighted in 2019, 2020, they're now crashing back where they should have been then. We sense. are re more or less reverting back to a normal marketplace. We're like getting back in alignment with where we wanted to be for years. Gotcha. The exception to that, I will say, would be the condo market downtown, right? Some of these buildings have 20 units for sale. Um, and out there, huh? So it's only in certain pockets. We still haven't had the working community come back to downtown. So we don't have that, uh, you know, the in-home need right now. We don't have a lot of commuter buyers. We don't have people coming in because they need to work at Google every day. So we haven't quite seen that uptick in buyers come back yet, but we are starting to see a whole new round of international investors, a whole new round of people looking for an in-town, a whole new round of people looking for a second home. So, the, you know, the marketplace is picking back up. The condos are just the last thing to recover from what we've seen. So, I, I mean, all of this, I think, points to the same underlying conclusions. If you're going to get in the marketplace right now, expect volatility and rely on the resources around you so that you can plan through it, right? Talk yeah. to your lender have a plan in place regardless of where the interest rates are so that you can figure out what you can actually afford. This is a great time to be sending properties like, hey, if I put 5% down on this, what would my cost breakdown be? How many people actually know that, but they can talk to you and get a, a feel for that? Yeah. And then start talking with me and that once we have a conversation of, you know, you can afford this in today's marketplace, then we'll go look and we'll go see if we can find it in today's marketplace. But I think if you start anywhere else, if you start in the fear or if you let interest rates be the reason you don't even start looking or if you let... The fact that the market is set for a crash, quote unquote, prevents you from even considering it. I think you just shoot yourself in the foot. You're not doing your due diligence. Well, I think it's always worth it to have a conversation with a real estate agent, with a lender to at least, if nothing else, it helps you prepare for when you are going to buy as well, too. Right. A hundred percent. This is the time more than ever when you should have your, your real estate agent, your lender, your financial advisor, and your accountants almost on conference calls, right? Like, <laughs> hey, what's up? let's go, everyone. And, and if you plan, you can be massively successful. I have investors, I have home buyers. I'm buying a home right now myself. I mean, there's many people who are active in the marketplace and finding success within the boundaries that do exist. But you can't do that unless you plan for it the right way. We're gonna, we, we should really just do these, you know, every few weeks, just checking on the news. I think right now there's no other way around it. There's a lot of volatility, which is what we talked about a lot with this. But if you're watching this and you're feeling like, holy shit, it's very confusing to get active in the real estate marketplace right now. And it's scary, to be honest, when I read the news, contact me, contact Derek, we'll have a conversation. Let's at least get through the bullshit and have a no, uh, a, a clear picture of, of what you want to accomplish. This is not a fun marketplace to operate in, but that's what we're here for. We're paid to be professionals, right? So we're here to guide you through the not fun, not easy times of real estate. Yeah, no, I think that that's a good way to leave it. Thank you for everybody uh, for watching. We appreciate you. Like, subscribe, follow. If you find this content interesting, check out our other interviews. And we will see you next time on the Rise in Real Estate podcast. Derek, good to see you, buddy.